HTP is the oxygen used by the motors of black light. It is high test peroxide. That is, hydrogen peroxide of a concentration greater than 80%. Although HTP is, without doubt, the most pleasant of all the oxygen to handle, precautions still have to be taken. It's the same hydrogen peroxide that the ladies use to bleach the hair. But whereas the ladies are using hydrogen peroxide at about 2 or 3% concentration, the stuff we use is 86%. We had a chap called Tony Simpkin. One day he went over to the test cell and it had a leak on the engine and he didn't realise, so he got some of this on his jacket. And when he went home that night, and he was sat having his tea, his jacket burst into flames. So he tried to get the company to pay him back the money on his jacket. They wouldn't do it. Not likely. <laughs> no. He said he should have been wearing the full length plastic suit. This HTP is very corrosive, and the men have to be fully protected with special clothing. Not everyone's idea of comfort. It was like a boiler suit, only it was in PVC. White PVC, And yeah. then you had Wellingtons on. And this the boiler suit went, this suit went over your Wellingtons. And you had a hood and you had goggles. Because if spilled, it will set fire to ordinary clothing or anything else that will burn. If you doubt it, just watch this bush. Although the engines were built in the Midlands and the completed rocket launched in Australia, the centre of Britain's rocket industry was the Isle of Wight, where the rockets were assembled and tested. Secret bunkers were built on the site of an old Napoleonic fort overlooking the Needles, and it was here that the rocket engineers gathered all the data they needed to be sure their rockets would fly. Um, so there was about oh, probably a dozen people together, plus one or two people wandering up and down looking rather anxious, <laughs> people in overall command. I was one of them, but uh, also the boss of the side uh, was, it was in there. And down below there's, you can see the sort of instrumentation we had, which was basically um, 1950s technology. And instead of having these vast displays you see in the Cape Canaveral sitting area, where you've got all these television screens and um, electronic clocks flashing away, we had a little mechanical clock and that would count down from two minutes to the firing. So tick, 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 five, four, three, two, one, and off you go. It was all programmed by pieces of cable. So you plugged a cable in there and the one there. So it was laced with cable. Not a computer. It wasn't a computer, was it? The only evidence we have on it. Ah, you've got one there. Yes. There you there go. We are. There you are. It was a thing like that. And these were all connectors, um, plugs and sockets. Yeah, no, none of this business about changing the software or computerized. Yeah. It was all done, done like that. And it worked. Yeah. And it worked perfectly too. The last two minutes of the firing sequence are under entirely automatic control. And on this board, electrical circuits are set up which bring in all the various systems at the right time. And after these have been set and checked, the unit is securely locked. The red flag is hoisted, the site is in an active state, and the static firing is about to take place. By that time, um, the dams will have been cleared, the red flag will have been flying, the coast guards and people would have been notified that a firing was imminent and all the guys responsible for their individual systems would be sat at these consoles uh, there and the data recording guys in there uh, nursing their bits of kit into operation. Um, the secrets officer down in the blockhouse was the man who had the final arming pin, if you like, for the blood to push in. Uh, and when the, the guys had finished fueling the vehicle, they would go into the blockhouse, pull the blast doors to behind them, still in their HTP suits, uh, and hoping that there was not going to be any severe problem. The safety officer could see through the armoured glass whichever gantry was being operated. Um, and then, of course, when everything was at the last point, the safety officer would put in the army plug, uh, the auto sequencer would take over, uh, and you'd Stand back. sit biting your nails, hoping right. that everything was going to go perfectly well through the next 30 seconds. The 
firing is nearly over, and the safety officer is watching to see if the motors shut down cleanly. That is the end of a successful test, and the rocket will now be packed and dispatched to Australia. Following rigorous testing at Hydao, the first Black Arrow began the long journey to its launch site at Woomera in Australia. 300 miles northwest of Adelaide, just to the north of a dry salt pan called Lake Hart, is Woomera Range. Less than 20 years ago, it was no more than an isolated halt on the Trans-Australian Railway. Today, it's a busy little town in the middle of nowhere, with a population of well over 5,000, including 1,600 children. <laughs> so, so given that the weather is quite abysmal today, <laughs> I know that most of you went out to Woomera. Could you tell us about it as a place? What was it like? Flat, empty and no rain. <laughs> Well, I mean, basically, what happened was this village called Woomera was built out in the middle of the Australian desert. The big five, by, when I went out there, there were about 5,000 people working out there. Mm. Uh, old families in wooden chalets, yeah. air-conditioned chalets, stacked right down in the middle of the Donga. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you could walk to the perimeter, the perimeter of, of the road of the place, and from there, as far as the eye could see, for hundreds and hundreds of miles, there was nothing but Donga, which mm. was stony desert, basically. My, my initiation into Woomera was, we landed in the airfield at Woomera, I was taken into the place where we were going to stay, the officer's mess, as we were billeted. And I sat down around the table like this, and there was Harry, whatever his name was, and uh, his crony sat around the table, and they said, you want a beer? So I said yes. And it was little schooners. Do you remember the schooners? Yeah. The little tiny schooners, Scoo yeah. schooners of beer. And a big jug, freezing cold beer. And I went, psh, 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 psh. we all sat there. And I suddenly somebody said, good night. And we all went, but don't, but don't, but don't, but don't, but don't, down with the glasses. We immediately filled up. This went on for an hour. I'd only just got off the bloody airplane <laughs> from, from, uh, from UK. Yeah. And it was terrible because I was plastered by the time I, before yeah. I'd even got there. <laughs> yeah. I remember there was one incident. I'm not sure whether it was a black arrow or a black knight, but uh, it, we went to release it oh, in Woomera. Oh, yeah. And it went up uh, five eighths of an inch, according to Jack Redpath. Yeah. And, and then settled back. And if it had and gone had, past the top dead centre, it would have all gone I over. I had a telling yeah. from this That's manager. why we define a successful uh, launch as 22 inches. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I, I had less telling from, from yeah. Jack Redpath. Yeah. And it said, Ray, you, uh, congratulations are now due that we've explored space from 5 eighths of an inch to 60 miles. <laughs>